Good morning, this is Dr. McDaniel. I'm a board certified obstetrician gynecologist in New York City and I'm bringing to you all things health related for women. Thank you for joining me at the corner today. Uh, obviously it's the weekend, I'm at the horse farm and they've done some renovations here. All of this is, this side over here is new. Did this during the 2020, 2021 uh, the border between those two years added all of that seating there, so it's very nice. Uh, the girls are inside for the horse lessons today. Even though it's a lovely day, it's usually when it's really nice, they'll come outside, but I guess that's not happening today, so it's pretty barren out here. But uh, today I thought I'd speak on a topic that came up the other day in the medical office uh, with a patient who's thinking about getting pregnant soon and she was asking am I still doing deliveries blah blah, blah. of course I said I, I haven't done del any deliveries and the last delivery I did was about 18 years ago I've been doing only GYN since then uh, it was 2004 was the last delivery I did I think it was October November 2004 I just remember I was seven months pregnant with my first child and that was it took lots of pictures for the momentous occasion and done no more obstetrics for me it's a lot of work so I was telling her that um, you know you have to be uh, savvy when you're choosing an obstetrician because just because someone is still practicing OB doesn't mean that they want to so you have, doesn't mean that they want to and even if they do want to doesn't mean that they're any good at it so anyone can do a taxi cab delivery is what I call the, the simple deliveries. They're taxi cab deliveries. Anyone can deliver a taxi cab uh, labor. So a taxi cab delivery is what I would call a delivery where the, um, the lady is able to breathe and uh, work with the labor pains, not have a flip out, thrashing and going nuts, which uh, some women do. So just keeping it real as they say. Uh, so she's able to breathe appropriately and stay in uh, somewhat level of control. She's not thrashing about. Um, it's uncomplicated, so there's no issues with um, the contractions becoming ineffective or stopping the progress of the delivery and the baby's not uh, abnormally enlarged. So that the shoulders get stuck and it requires special maneuvers to deliver the rest of the baby after the head comes out. So just kind of once the head's out, the rest of the baby slips out. So that's a taxi cab delivery. Anyone can do that. Um, in fact, you don't need even you don't even need someone to deliver if you're in a safe um, location. You can just deliver your own baby, right? <laughs> so those are quick, easy deliveries. But you, you have to prepare for potential complications or potential disaster when you're practicing obstetrics. So for that, you're always going to want to make sure that you have someone who is well trained to handle complications that, and of course, complications are unpredictable and they occur at the last moment during uh, a complicated labor or a long labor. So you just want to make sure that you can vet out the obstetrician. Now, if you're using a midwife, they're supposed to have an obstetrician on hand in case you need an operative delivery for a complication. So that would be either forceps, vacuum, or C-section, or if there's a problem during the labor, you get uh, an infection, you have a fever, the labor slows down, you need medication to augment it. So um, you can have excellent doctors at not so great hospitals and not so great doctors at excellent hospitals but common things being common you're not going to see that frequently so you're going to want to make sure that you vet out a good hospital a hospital that has um, good labor and delivery ward adequate number of labor suites so you're not laboring in the hallway somewhere that happens at some hospitals they may only have four labor and delivery suites if you get four people ahead of you, you're not going to be in one of those suites. You're going to be in the hallway or sitting in the the um, intake room where you're just supposed to get your vitals and then be moved to a suite. 
or they may be rushing the patients to get them out of the labor suite so that people behind them can get in them can can get in the rooms because that's their um you know that's their their advertising that's their media uh, they want to keep the reputation that everyone gets their gorgeous suites, but if they only have four, they can't allow someone to languish there. They're going to hurry up and deliver you by hook or by crook. So those are important. So the first importance is the hospital that you'll be delivering at. Is it a, a reputable hospital? Uh, how many labor suites do they have? How busy do they usually get? Um, the nursing staff, what kind of nursing support do they have? Is it adequate if there's more than four or five patients there? And um, the neonatal ICU, if there's a complication, the baby would have to go to the ICU for at least a couple of hours. And do they have an ICU to uh, accommodate any potential severe complications? Some hospitals don't have uh, an upper level ICU and if there is a baby who needs to be on some kind of life support they will helicopter or ship the baby out to another hospital nearby so those are the kind of things you'll want to know to be prepared in case there's a catastrophe with your labor and delivery and then lastly is going to be the doctor because you can have a great doctor, but if the hospital isn't so good, they don't have enough staff, they don't have enough rooms, they don't have an ICU, in case the doctor delivers your baby and there was a complication through no fault of their own, you're going to be in trouble. So the doctor's the last part of the equation. And then of course, they're still important because they're going to, once you have everything in line, if you get a sucky doctor, you're going to have potentially poor outcomes regardless of all the help and the support that they have so in, in that case then you want a doctor who is um, fairly well established so you know you can't put a ton of weight on the residency training but it does actually count because if you don't have the training regardless of how quick you are how clever you are how fast you can learn how to do surgeries and, and procedures Bellevue those that's awesome training I'm not trying to toot my own horn but I'm just stating a fact I think it's very well known OBGYN at NYU Bellevue has always been really really good of course it was 30 years ago so we did a lot more than residents nowadays across the country they have less less autonomy more supervision the more autonomy you have sure the more you can more often there may be complications because you have people who aren't fully trained running the show, but in the right scenario with the right people, more autonomy allows you to be better because you're forced to make decisions and you're forced to uh, get more experience. So we got a lot of experience, 93 to 97 is when I trained at Bellevue NYU. Uh, so you want to just check out the OB doctor. I think doing interviews with the doctor is stupid <laughs> just, to, just to say it's dumb because you don't know how well they are with their how good they are at their hands how well um, uh, they're able to handle stressful situations you're not going to know that in an interview they can tell you whatever you want to hear in an interview interviews the only thing an interview will do is get you a small sense of their personality. And personality, frankly, is not important. You need someone who knows what they're doing, can handle stressful situations, can handle emergencies, has a good depth of knowledge and experience. Whether or not you like them is should be irrelevant. You're not looking for a best friend. You're not looking for a BFF. Uh, you're not looking for someone who's going to crack jokes. I've known lots of doctors who are very, very personable. They crack lots of jokes. In fact, someone I know was on a couple of television series. Uh, everybody loves her. But she's not a great physician. She doesn't know a lot. She, When she used to do her surgeries, when I was a resident, she couldn't operate. Everybody did the surgeries for her. And she used to say, just make sure that the, the wound looks good because that's what the patient's going to see. They're going to see how pretty the, the scar is. So... 
getting someone who's personable is not always going to mean that they know what they're doing, right? Personality isn't super important. It's important in a beauty pageant, but not in your doctor. So, and I used to have to tell patients that because once I stopped doing deliveries, now they're looking for someone with, a, you know, a nice personality and they feel comfortable with. And I used to have to tell them, listen, just because you don't, he, he or she isn't chatting a lot to you doesn't mean that they don't know what they're doing. So you're not, stop trying to find a BFF. I would get patients who would transfer their care because they don't like the doctor two, three, four times. I mean, that's ridiculous. Just do some research. Don't go interviewing the doctor because it's the best laid plans of mice and men, right? You go do an interview, and we used to always say it's a kiss of death to have a birthing plan. And, you know, I might speak on, I might do, a, a, I can do a whole presentation on birthing plans. But, you know, they may agree to you, they can agree to anything before you're in labor. And then all they're going to say is, listen, XYZ is happening, you need a C-section. And guess what you're going to say 99% of the time because you, you want the baby to be healthy? Okay. So it, it doesn't matter. Interviews are, are pointless. You can get your interview done in the first actual visit for the baby. And the interview should really just be uh, to ask them what their C-section rate is uh, and what their thoughts are about uh, delivery, whatever's important to you, pain medicine or no pain medicine, natural labor or augmented what their um, kind of uh, ethics and um, emphasis is. So really, you can get that done in the first visit. Once you've done the research, you should pretty much know 98% confidence whether or not it's going to be a good obstetrician for you. And the last 2% is just whether or not you're, you find their personality tolerable or not. So let's see, so for the OB doctor, it's gonna be where they train because that's going to give you an indication of the level of experience they were afforded during their four years of residency training. After that, um, what their C-section rate is because if you have a high, you know, it's a little difficult not to have a pretty a slightly elevated c-section rate nowadays because the hospitals uh, the OB department upper echelons they put a lot of pressure on doctors to do cesareans uh, sooner rather than later so uh, on average average c-section rate is going to be around 20 percent so a doctor who's really you know proactive and trying to get those vaginal deliveries done, theirs will be maybe 16%. The ones who are real quick to drop the blade, as we used to call it, uh, the surgical blade, the scalpel, it's going to be around 30-35% or higher, depending on the doctor. Uh, on average, 20% is probably what you're going to find. Anything lower than that means they're working really, really hard to prevent a lot of the peer pressure and hospital administration pressure to not do C-sections. Uh, and um, those are the kind of doctors that you want because I mean, most people don't want surgery when they don't have to have it. And um, I think I'll also do another presentation on the difference between C-sections and vaginal deliveries. And so let's see, so once you've vetted out the doctor's training, their experience, the hospital they're at, looked at the, the nursing staffing issue, the labor and delivery uh, number of suites and, and uh, how busy they get, um, then it's just location and proximity. So most people, especially with the first baby, it's, they're not going to go rushing into the hospital with their knees clamped together to prevent delivering. They usually going to be uh, a little bit more of a nervous Nelly and they're going to go too soon. So hospital location, as long as it's within an hour of where you are, nine times out of ten, you're going to get there with too much time. So <laughs> the key is to, to not get to the hospital too soon where you're languishing and super early labor because most hospitals, most labor and deliveries won't send you home nowadays. They don't want to lose the business. OB is big business so years ago we used to send you home you know it didn't matter 
you came trekking out an hour away, there was a thunderstorm, a uh, hurricane, it didn't matter. You're not in labor, you're not staying in the hospital, you're going back home. Uh, but now it doesn't matter what the story is. If you go in, they're going to keep you because they don't want you going home. And then a day or two later, you go to the local hospital because you don't want to make the trek. And then the local hospital keeps you and they keep the money for your, de for your uh, delivery. So... Um, that being said, I'm going to wrap it up now because I know this is a, a long presentation. I get really chatty. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Please hit the like, subscribe, and follow buttons. Uh, make sure you post any questions you have or any ideas or topics for future uh, presentations. And, and make sure you check out the not just the Facebook, but the YouTube channel and all of the podcasts. I'm on all of the platforms for the podcast. Take care. Bye.